Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Lori O'Brien. She's a principal investigator, assistant professor, in the Department of uh, Cell Biology and Physiology at UNC Chapel Hill in the Kidney Center. So we're going to talk about kidney disease and dialysis and transplants and all those, you know, wonderful things. So, Lori, thanks for coming. Hey, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here and talk about uh, our research and efforts in the kidney. Yeah, so what's your research about? What are you looking at right now? So our, our research really covers a spectrum of things, I'd say, um, from the very basics of development in the kidney to understanding how do you make a kidney, what are the components and mechanisms necessary to, to make the different parts of the kidney. And from that, we can understand more about what goes wrong in disease, whether it's disease in infants or disease in adults and, and those different aspects and then you know when things go wrong understanding the mechanisms um, but also from the perspective of development trying to understand you know if we ever want to have you know the idea of a renal replacement could you ever make a whole kidney or could you ever make new nephrons in the kidney nephrons being the filtering component of the kidney you know how can we do that and really understanding the basics of developmental biology are pretty key uh, to be able to do that and have informed a lot of like recent efforts, such as generating kidney organoids from pluripotent stem cells, essentially making little mini kidneys in a dish. And, mm. you know, being able to advance those types of studies, you know, we need to understand a little bit more about uh, the developmental process itself and then also what's going wrong in disease. Yeah, I've heard that kidneys are like the most complicated organ we have, I guess, maybe besides <laughs> the brain. But Yeah, absolutely. It is incredibly compact complex, the amount of physiology that your kidneys, you know, do on a daily basis in terms of blood filtration and how they accomplish those feats and also the hormones they produce to control things like, the, you know, your blood pressure and um, uh, red blood cell counts and all that. I mean, it, it is very complex. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know, there's a lot to discover yet, I think, even about, you know, the very basics, you know, and, trying to understand how do you, you know, acquire this complexity, you know, and what kind of complexity is necessary to, to have a fully functional kidney. Well, what, what parts of the kidney are uh, used to make organoids and which parts are largely ignored or not well understood right now? Um, so in terms of the organoid, um, so we, we basically starting, so kidney development essentially requires two different cell populations, a mesenchymal population. Um, these are really progenitor cells, and these are going to form um, cells that make up the nephrons, and nephrons being the filtering units of the kidney. And then you have what needs to be your collecting duct system. So those nephrons need to hook up to that collecting duct system. So when they take and filter your blood and they get rid of that filtrate, they need to deposit it into that collecting duct system so then it can make its way down eventually to the bladder for excretion. And so in the field of organoids and trying to make kidneys, um, people have um, gotten into, okay, so how do we, you know, derive these populations from pluripotent stem cells? And the first major advances were really in deriving that nephron population. So taking it through the stages of development um, from, you know, pluripotent stem cells to the mesoderm to then, you know, the cells that give rise to those nephrons. Um, And then also now more recent efforts have been working on actually generating that collecting duct system. And so now, you know, the hopes would be that someday we can put these two together and have them, you know, be a step closer, you know, to having more of a kidney in a dish. But I would say at this point, a lot of the primary work with these organoids, you know, has really focused on really making those nephrons in a dish. 
because they really are the functional unit of the kidney and what is doing all the filtering for you. How many nephrons does the average kidney have? So the average kidney has about 1 million nephrons. Um, And interestingly, uh, recent studies um, over the last decade have really started to look into this a little little more and found that that is actually hugely variable in individuals from anywhere from maybe 200,000 nephrons per kidney up to 2.5 million per kidney. And that nephron endowment can actually, you know, have implications too. And this comes into some of our research and understanding the progenitors that give rise to the nephrons and how those programs during development are controlled so that you make a sufficient number of nephrons because there are correlations between having a lower number of nephrons and an increased risk for high blood pressure um, and, you know, potential for kidney disease later in life. And so, what, so is, what, is kidney, uh, what does kidney disease look like? What happens with the kidney? Yeah, so kidney disease, <laughs> I mean, it's a very broad, you know, word that we use to describe any, you know, number of diseases, things that can affect the kidney. There can be a whole spectrum uh, of things that affect various cell populations in the kidney or genetic, um, you know, or caused by other factors like diabetes, high blood, high blood pressure, things like that. Um, but eventually what it ultimately leads to is the compromise in kidney function. So when we talk about kidney disease, we're generally talking about something like chronic kidney disease, where there's actually a reduction in kidney function. And there's different stages of uh, chronic kidney disease um, that you can go through about five stages, you know, before the fifth stage really being the stage where we classify it as end-stage renal disease. And this is the stage where you're going to see people going on and needing dialysis and transplant um, as really the only options that they have to be able to, you know, maintain, you know, the, you know, to filter their blood and, and keep them alive. And I think the common misconceptions about this, you know, People think, oh, you know, kidney, you know, and it's a bit underestimated, you know, how, you know, the impact kidney disease can have on health. And, you know, what it means is people, you know, think that dialysis and transplant are kind of like cures for kidney disease, but really they're not, you know, we dialysis is just a means to filter your blood and it can only do about 10% of the job that your kidneys would normally do. And the lifetime... Oh uh, yeah, so it's it's really you know it's sufficient it's sufficient well, happens, to keep you uh, alive. But <laughs> yeah, why why is dialysis so much less effective than what our kidneys do? What what's missing? I think it's yeah, I you know I think it's just the intricacy of the kidneys and how much they do and how much they perform in types of the um, you know filtration and all the filtration, the things that they filter out or keep in and, you know, different, you know, salts and, and, um, you know, other things that, that make their way into the filtrate, you know, dialysis machines are sort of a bit more simplistic and then they can't control and modulate all the things that a kidney would normally. Um, and so, and there's other functions that kidney does too, with some of these hormones that they secrete that can't be controlled by a dialysis machine because really they're just filtering the blood. And so, you know, the dialysis is just, you know, a very simplified kidney filter in a sense. And so the membranes that do all the work in the dialysis machine just cannot do everything that a kidney can do. And, um, you know, those are things that, you know, not my group specifically, but, you know, others in the field are definitely working on, you know, are there ways we can improve dialysis? But, you know, the lifetime a person can be on dialysis, you know, is maybe an average of five years that they can survive on dialysis. Although there are cases of people who can go up to 20 years or so, Um, but generally it's about five. Um, And similarly with kidney transplants, those are not a lifetime fix either. And so, you know, the average lifespan of the kidney transplant may be something like 15 years, 10, 15 years um, before you would maybe need another kidney. Um, so, so what or, you, you know, what's your research uh, focused on then? What aspect? Yeah, so my research then is focused, um, we've done a large part with understanding um, these 
progenitor cells that give rise to the nephrons. So all of, so the nephron itself, I said, is the filtering unit, but it's, you know, we talked about the complexity of the kidney and that nephron has many different cell types that all perform, you know, very distinct functions to, you know, really modulate that filtrate and to ensure that you're keeping all the stuff you need in, in your blood and keeping, you know, regulating all your pH and, you know, um, very sodium and, um, potassium levels and all that. And, you know, also excreting what needs to be excreted. And so, but the interesting thing is during development, even though all those, you know, cells have very distinct functions, they all come from one common progenitor cell called the nephron progenitor. And so we've really kind of focused in on, you know, how do you maintain a nephron progenitor throughout development? So I should say that as your kidney is developing, um, so in the humans, it's maybe from about five weeks of gestation up to about 36 weeks of gestation that you're doing nephrogenesis and actually making those nephrons of the kidney and those, um, nephron progenitor cells are around, but by the time you're born, you no longer have any of those progenitor cells and you are set with the number of nephrons you're going to have for the rest of your life. So if there's you're only, you know, essentially going to lose nephrons from that point on, you know, there's, there's no way to make it a new one. And so, you know, we're under, we're trying to understand what kind of, you know, programs from transcriptional programs um, and signaling programs, you know, crosstalk between cells in the kidney, um, you know, are modulating, you know, that nephron progenitor pool to ensure that you can make a sufficient number of nephrons, keep them kind of self-renewing and in dividing for the amount of time they need to be around. And so we've done a lot of work trying to understand um, sort of, you know, networks in terms of signaling molecules or transcription factors and kind of what they're controlling and really, you know, you know, certain programs they're supporting um, to keep their lifetime or lifespan and, you know, keep them self-renewing, but also what makes them differentiate too, what makes them form a nephron and how do you modulate that process? And, um, and really so what, also, yeah, go ahead. What, what happens in kidney disease then? Do the nephrons die? Do they just become <laughs> low functioning? Like what happens physiologically? Hmm. Right, right. So during kidney disease, um, you can sort of have a spectrum of going from nephrons that aren't functioning uh, sufficiently, that they have reduced function, um, that they aren't filtering as well, or um, certain parts of the nephron aren't performing, you know, as, as sufficiently as they normally would. And you can have a progression to a phase where you essentially have that nephron itself becomes non-functional and um, that you can have the death, essentially the death of that nephron um, and it no longer will work at all. So it, it really kind of varies in the spectrum of, of what's going on with those nephrons. Hmm. So uh, in nephron, well, nephrogenesis, I guess you call it, uh, yeah. you said mm -hmm. what, in a five week span, all the nephrons you're going to get are then created or like, so, what does that look like that process? Yeah, so, so it's a process of, so it goes from about five weeks of gestation to 36, so maybe about 30 weeks you're forming your nephrons in the human. And so over that span of 30 weeks, it's just a continued, you know, to really break it down simply, it's a continued process of um, keeping those progenitors like self-renewing. So you got to keep them going because um, they're you don't, you don't have the set pool right at five weeks, you have to keep making more because you have to make a million nephrons. And so you keep making more of those nephron progenitor cells, but at the same time, some of those cells are going on to differentiate. So you don't form all your million nephrons at one time. It's actually formed over uh, a period of time um, during that, uh, you know, 30 week period. Um, and so it's really this balance that the kidney needs to strike between, you know, keeping those cells self-renewing and then also differentiating them. And so, you know, this becomes of interest to 
you know, let's say preterm infants who are born prematurely, um, when they are still undergoing this process of kidney development and making all those nephrons, or um, infants born with congenital anomalies, things that are genetic or um, caused by environmental um, conditions or from the mother entering uterine environment or growth restrictions. And how does that then affect this process? And so, you know, understanding the normal process of how it works, we can then begin to break apart some of these diseases and the influences they're having on that program, you know, why they may break that balance between self-renewal and differentiation, or you may end up with uh, less nephrons. And that is something that has been seen in really low birth weight infants or preterm infants that um, there have been some studies that have shown that they tend to have fewer nephrons and are then at more risk for developing things like high blood pressure and kidney disease later in life. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Have, uh, has anyone been able to create even one fully functioning nephron in a dish <laughs> or like how far off are we? Yeah, um, so that, that's a great, great question. And so we're, we're a bit far off from that, I think, um, because the biggest part and the biggest issue we have is, you know, that nephron needs to filter. And so you need to have it hooked up to, uh, you know, a, a vascular system that is pumping blood through and, you know, and could have, you know, that we could then see that this is actually filtering. And so within a dish itself, you know, we can get these nephrons to form, but the biggest problem with these organoids is they don't have a vascular system. So they don't have blood vessels that form this nice network that can then, you know, and in, in, integrate with these nephrons so that it can form its filtration. And, you know, what happens in a dish is very crude. And so the advances, um, what people have been trying to do on that end is making more microfluidic devices to start, you know, pumping fluids at least through and incorporating an endothelial network um, of the, or making these blood vessels in these organoids and seeing, you know, can the nephron then actually filter and function? Um, and I think we're still a bit off from that. And we don't know if we could say we've created any sort of, you know, fully functional nephron in a dish yet. But what people have started doing is transplanting these um, organoids so they can transplant them into a kidney of, let's say, a mouse. And so they can actually put them in and see if a, a blood vessel network a vascular network can actually hook up to these organoids and form. And what they found is that the host can actually, you know, take and form, um, you know, blood vessels can grow in and actually grow into these, these organoids. But the biggest problem is these organoids, these nephrons, they may start to have some mild filtering ability. Let's say they can filter a bit of that blood and make a little filtrate that then can start making its way and down this nephron into this tubule. So the nephron's this tubule-like structure. It has a filter that's like a molecular sieve. That's where all the blood filtration happens. And then it makes a filtrate that then goes down the rest of the tube. But the problem is that filtrate in that tube has nowhere to go. Those nephrons aren't hooked up to anything. Like I said before, you need that collecting duct system. Those nephrons need to hook up to that or hook up to another nephron potentially, or hook up to something that they have a way to get rid of that filtrate. And so that's, you know, I think right now, you know, maybe two of the biggest hurdles is really getting that blood vessel system to hook up and function properly and filter properly, and then to actually take that filtrate and put it somewhere so that it can be removed from the body eventually. Yeah. Well, what's the level of... Uh expanded differentiation you'll get or differentiation you'll get when you, uh, you know, send the organoid to kidney school and, you know, put it near a kidney and inside a host and, you know, mm -hmm. how much more does it develop once you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if anybody's really specifically looked at the maturation it, after the transplant and um, some of these cells. So this is one of the biggest problems with organoids and not just kidney organoids, but organoids, you know, brain organoids, um, organoids, liver organoids, you know, whatever 
organoid you're going to make in a dish is that if you're taking them from pluripotent stem cells and differentiating them into these organoids is that the cells remain very immature and almost fetal like. And so if you look at their programs, they look more like, you know, a kidney that's still in, you know, still developing. And so by hooking up some of this, this blood vessel network and getting some of that flow through, there have been um, some studies that have shown that you can increase the maturation of some of these cells, um, such as those in that filtration apparatus, and that they can look a little more like the uh, adult or, or functional cell. But that's not every cell. And I don't think every cell has really been examined for its, you know, physiological function in terms of, is it mature enough? Is it performing all the things, you know, that a normal cell would do? I think, you know, we're, that's still an open-ended question. Like even when you transplant them into a kidney, uh, you know, how mature are they? And I don't think we really have a good answer to that yet. Yeah, but what, what's the difference between the level of differentiation you can get them to, you know, in a dish versus one mm-hmm. that uh, they're they're hanging out with their, you know, with a with a regular kidney for a period yeah. of time? Have they been placed with it and then removed and then analyzed to see now what's changed? Yeah. So I so I don't know of any study that you know off the top of my head thinking and. and of recently that have looked at it after it's been transplanted and looked at the maturation to see how sufficient it was or the physiology, let's say, is it, you know, doing the sodium transport the way it needs to, is it doing, um, you know, the clearance that it needs to. And um, we just haven't been there yet. I I don't doubt there's people out there doing this right now (laughs) as we speak, you know, trying to assess more of this and trying to understand and, and the question, it also begs the question, you know, do we need it to be that mature? You know, if it's enough to get by, you know, like dialysis, let's say, you know, it only performs, you know, maybe 10% of the kidney function. Do we need these cells to be that mature, you know, as long as they're maybe performing some of the minor filtration and minor functions, you know, maybe it's sufficient for, you know, some period of time for them to, to just be that way. And maybe we don't need to go all the way, you know, to a fully mature kidney. So, you know, I think, I think we just don't know that yet, you know, what really will be sufficient. Well, I mean, what are you hoping to figure out by studying uh, nephrogenesis? What particular Um, questions do you want to answer? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, interested in understanding, um, you know, nephron progenitors and really like how they're maintained and maintaining them in a dish and things like that for the, for the future. And, you know, could we ever dream of transplanting even a nephron progenitor cell into a kidney? So maybe you can't, maybe the organoids not, but maybe you could, you know, put some nephron progenitors in there. And, you know, we really need to understand what kind of environment these nephron progenitors need you know, and what signals they need that would make them differentiate in the kidney. And again, also hook them up to that collecting duct system. And by, you know, what we're doing in our research, we're um, trying to understand, you know, how, how we can do that, what signals are needed and, um, you know, what programs are we controlling. And so the other part I I should say that we're trying to understand um, and really dig into is, how those blood vessel networks um, are formed in the kidney and how important they are to kidney development. Like I said, some of these organoids seem to mature a little bit more, you know, once they get um, vascularized, once they have this blood vessel network. So from a developmental perspective, we're trying to understand, well, what's the role of this blood vessel network um, in the kidney and um, also the nerves and innervation of the kidney. That's one thing we haven't done with organoids at all is innervated them. And the kidney is definitely innervated and it has, these nerves have functions in modulating um, things like some of the hormone excretion by the kidney and controlling function. Um, so, you know, how do we think about this? You know, are these networks such as the blood vessels or the nerves also important for kidney development? Do they support 
you know, maybe some of these nephron progenitor programs, do they, you know, or support the differentiation of these cells and that if we incorporate these networks, the vascular networks and the nerves, you know, into kidneys and um, things like that, are they going to help that process along as well? And so we use in our research right now, we're trying to really understand these networks so we can genetically perturb them. Um, so we can, you know, potentially get rid of innervation in the kidney um, in our mouse models and see, you know, what is the result on kidney development? Or we can look at what kind of signals are these cells secreting? So if, you know, I was saying that these cells, these networks, um, blood vessels and and nerve cells, these, um, they might be secreting things or supporting other cells in the kidney. So there's crosstalk between all these cells. So they're not just single, you know, cells just, you know, by themselves, you, you know, they're sitting next to other cells. They're going to be talking to the cells, you know, the microenvironment that they're in can have a significant influence on their function and their development and self-renewal or, you know, migration or anything, you know, any of these cellular functions. And so what we're trying to understand is there are signals coming from these blood vessels or these nerves during development that could support this. And, you know, perhaps we can, in the sense of organoids or, or something like that, that we can, or even if we transplanted something into a kidney, like a nephron or nephron progenitors, what do we need? What are these blood vessels or nerve networks doing, you know, to support that? And how can we incorporate them or even just come up with what signals they're releasing and at least give them this proper signals that they need, you know, uh, to help them along? Well, it sounds like you, you know, you'd need to look at things macroscopically a lot more, you know, and see them in vivo, what they're doing. And, you know, I don't know if you can look at, uh, you know, during nephrogenesis, if you're doing it in a mouse. Maybe you can take uh, samples and freeze them at different stages and longitudinally reconstruct, okay, physically, what am I seeing? Day one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, five, six. And perhaps that might give you some idea of the signaling, what comes first and next, and you know, mm -hmm. in what order is the structure built, and then emulating that, and that might get you further along the path towards doing this. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that has been a lot of very recent, recent advances in sort of, um, some of these imaging techniques that we can do now and the ability to see larger structures and organization, like you said, at more of this macro level of how these things are interacting with each other and how, you know, these are forming. And, and so we are doing that with some of these, these vessels and these, um, and these nerve networks. And we can now take all in, we use it in our, our mouse models, but we can take a whole kidney at various stages in the mouse and we can then um, take that whole kidney and label just those networks, the blood vessel networks or the nerve networks, and we can see what is their organization in the kidney, when are they forming, when are they coming in, and are these, how does this relate then to you know, how does their organization relate then to things like the nephron progenitors or the developing nephrons? When do they become important in this process? And so we can really now look at that in this 3D space and be able to start to assess and sort of combine that with the studies we do at the more genetic level where we can perturb these networks and look for certain signals or, um, you know, and then, or, you know, put those two together and start, you know, mapping out this process. Has anyone even been able to make an organoid just of the tube of one nephron, like a sub nephron component? Um, that's, yeah, not, not so much. I mean, it's, so it's. You guys uh, say, come on, yeah. organoid people. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, so you can make various cell types of, you know, perhaps nephrons. So you can make directed differentiation, you know, so you could take cells and direct them to maybe become a proximal tubule cell. So this specialized part in the proximal part of the nephron or make a podocyte cell, which is part of the filtration unit. So you can make individual cells within that, um, but um, really kind of making more than that one individual cell, um, really people have only accomplish that with sort of the organoid, you know, and then you, then you make sort of 
more of the components of the nephron in the dish. Um, you really need more than just, um, like if you took that nephron progenitor cell and you put it in a dish by itself, um, it'll differentiate to some extent, but you're not really going to get a whole nephron to form, you know, just a single nephron from a small pool of nephron progenitors, you know, by itself. It's really, you know, likes to have all these other things around, like I said, these other um, cell types, um, like other mesenchymal cells, these stromal cells that are support cells in the kidney. And really, it's just um, hard to accomplish that in a dish. I mean, like I said, the kidney is so complex, and there's so much interplay between all these cell types. It's, you know, really breaking it down into these simple things can be quite difficult because it's so interdependent. If, I wonder if, you know, if um, there would be a group that would try to make a, you know, like emulate mechanically, macroscopically the kidney, you know, mm-hmm. uh, again, much larger than what's in the kidney, but, you know, just for a start, like just trust, okay, it's design, it's design is there for a reason and try to, again, mechanically emulate it and see right. how it functions and what, what you observe fluid flow wise, et cetera. And then, at, at the very mm-hmm. least, maybe for dialysis, that would be better than the current machinery that's used. If it mm-hmm. tries to incorporate more of what the kidney has, even if it's not known why it may help or not, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And there is a very precise arrangement of things in the kidney, like the nephrons. You have these juxta medullary nephrons, and those are, you know, the actual arrangement of this nephron, this looping of this tube, the, of the nephron tube. It creates, uh, it's a way to help uh, concentrate the urine. And so these, you know, very specific arrangements of the nephrons within the kidney actually have implications for function. And we think that with the, the blood vessels as well, that, you know, this very specific organization can have implications for function. And so what people, you know, there's a some obvious ways people could go about this, like maybe bioprinting, you know, could you bioprint if you know, if you can map it out, you know, could you sort of bioprint this in a way that you could form, you know, maybe a small kidney by, by doing something like that. Or other ways people are kind of going about that is to take a kidney and decellularize it. So you essentially strip it down to, you know, its matrix, um, you take all the cells off, and try and repopulate it, you know, with, with other, with cells, you know, and sort of form that same structured kidney again. Um, You know, if you repopulate with these cells, can you actually, you know, you retain that structure then because that matrix that's in there, that still retains a lot of the shape of the kidney or, you know, sort of the outline of maybe where a nephron was or a blood vessel was. And so, you know, can you, can you do this again? And so those, I think, you know, would be some of the more logical, uh, you know, efforts or perhaps, you know, once we start putting cell types together. So let's say, you know, like I said, the organoids you have, you know, at this point, these organoids that form nephrons, and then you have these organoids where you form mostly the collecting duct system. So once you start to incorporate those together and put them together, now is there more instructions there, right? More of a blueprint that that directs, you know, this kidney how to form. So, you know, if you start mixing more cell types together, can you now start to to get better form, you know? Well, there's got to be massive orchestration. I mean, look at all this crazy detail and layer upon layer upon layer. And, you know, it's, it's like, if you start from the center of the kidney and go radially outwards, I mean, you're going through like God knows how many layers of intricate stuff. So the signaling is amazing to do all this. It's crazy. you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's like why I love the kidney. Cause it's, I feel like it's a never ending question. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be questions on how we, you, how do you form this? You know what the, it's just such a beautiful structure, you know, organization to this and, you know, how, you know, these layers upon layers and how this is formed during the process of development and how important, you know, really is that structure for, you know, function. And I think we can get some information from that because you have children born with congenital anomalies that may affect, you know, the structure of the kidney that, 
something is wrong with their collecting duct system or something, you know, is, is structurally wrong. And that well, can if, affect the kidney function. And so we, you know, there is some with, with healthy <laughs> kidneys. I mean, if you, if you show me like a hundred different neuro, you know, if you, if you took a picture of like a hundred different nephrons and you put them mm-hmm. all up on a wall and I look at them, you know, do they all have to have four loops? Do they all, you know, is there any variation even amongst healthy people that, again, mm-hmm. has been macroscopically observed? Maybe you can, you know, figure out, tease out some of the secrets of the nephron by looking. You know, if there's yeah. almost no variation, okay, well, mm-hmm. why does it have to be this way only? Or if there's variation, but it still works, hmm, okay, well, maybe there's a, mm-hmm. a, you know, guide rules here that we can figure out. Right, right. Um, that's That's a great question. And I... You know, everybody, you know, when you look at anything, it's a very stereotypical, um, you know, loop sort of, you have these sort of loops and these nephrons. And for the most part, that pattern is very well conserved in the nephrons. Um, So if you, you know, put a hundred different nephrons up next to each other, like if you you image them in that kidney, for the most part, they will have, you know, very similar organization. You know, you know, there might be slight differences, but, you know, I think for the most part, it is a pretty well conserved um, um, organization. And, you know, what we can confer from that and, you know, how important that is. And like I said, there are there is a significance to some of that in terms of uh, like urine concentration where these juxtamedullary nephrons um, that are more in the interior of the kidney, they have this really long loop of Henle. And um, this really is important for um, creating this, this current, this um, osmotic gradient and really creating this um, thing. So, you know, if you don't have that in, you know, whatever you're creating in a dish or whatever your transplant you know, you're not going to concentrate the urine as much and, you know, you're not going to um, do that function properly, probably, um, properly. And so, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, maybe again. Is, the, um, is yeah. the kidney completely parallel, meaning that, um, you know, the inlet material, blood, whatever it is, goes through all the nephrons in parallel or are there nephrons that the material will go through after it's been through a primary type of nephron? Um, is, so it should go through. So the each um, nephron should get its own individual um, blood supply. And that, so you have an, a split off of all these vessels and then you have them, you know, continuously split off until each nephron has its own individual blood supply. And then you, so that's all these sort of arteries coming in and then you're going to have it move through that filtration part of the nephron. um, And then it's going to make its way back um, to the return system. So each individual nephron has, you know, a a, um, a return vessel that will go back up, hook up to the vein and and come back out. And so, um, you know, as far as I understand, there really isn't any sort of recycling, you know, through through nephrons per se. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered if there's any secondary ones or you get one mm-hmm. pass, but it goes through like a million of them at once and then out comes the output. Yeah. So, I mean, it, but the, I guess, you know, that kind of is accomplished by the constant filtration that the kidney is doing. So it's, you know, they all goes in and comes out, but then you know, this, the, the blood flow is continuous. So, you know, it's just continuously moving through and moving through and moving through. And so there's really, you know, a continuous input and continuous output. So it's really no need to kind of go through a secondary, you know, filtration of any nephron. So, um, you know, for the most part, all the nephrons are doing their, their individual function in that filtration. Uh, it's probably a really basic question, but I guess I don't know. So does does urine start? Is is its creation in the kidney from blood from fil- filtrate of blood and other you know from proteins? Yeah, yeah, yep. And so essentially, that's um, what's happening as the filtrate makes its way down the nephron. And so, like so it's said, taking blood and it's separating out 
wastes and other components, combining them with other stuff. And that's the inception. That's the creation of urine first happens in the kidney. Yes. Yes. So, so that, um, so that first filtration is at this, um, apparatus called the glomerulus, And that's where the, you have these highly specialized cells that wrap around the blood vessels and that, and with this intervening glomerular basement membrane. So that those blood vessels that are in that, these capillaries that are in that glomerulus, that filtration unit, have fenestrations, meaning they have little holes in them. And so this allows that filtrate to actually move through those cells with these little holes in them. And so, but those little holes, and then also this sort of network of um, these cells that overlay that endothelium, they form a sieve, essentially. And so your blood cells and platelets and large proteins are going to stay in your bloodstream and get recycled back. But the rest of that filtrate is going to move through those holes in that molecular sieve and then make its way into that tube, the rest of the tube, uh, which is that nephron. Um, And so, like I said, there's these really highly specialized cells all around that nephron. So you can't just get rid of that filtrate because you would get rid of, you know, a lot of salts and, and all kinds of water. And you you need to conserve some of that water and um, some of those things and get them back into your system. And so what all those cells types along that nephron do is they modify that filtrate then. And so they'll continue to potentially absorb more from um, the the bloodstream or they'll um, do secretion or excretion functions and transport of sodium across, you know, tubule membranes and and things. So they're really balancing out um, that filtrate. And so you're going to get some of that filtrate back into your body as it moves its way through the nephron, it's going to get reabsorbed, but then the rest of it is eventually gets concentrated down and is going to have all those things uh, that make up urine and that you're again, eventually going to excrete. And so that makes its way, by the time it makes its way out of the nephron, a lot of that has been accomplished. And there's a few more things that go on as that moves into the collecting duct system. But then as soon as you get into that collecting duct system, um, you then have this filtrate that moves into the ureter. And then that ureter is, goes all the way down to your bladder. And so by that point, you know, you have your urine moving down um, into your bladder. Mm. Yeah. So incredibly, like you said, incredibly complex physiology of of how all that works. Well, very good. Lori, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and, uh, you know, uh, read papers and uh, see more? Yes. um, So we, um, we can find me at the UNC Chapel Hill Department of Cell Biology and Physiology website. And also we have a web page that describes a little bit more of our research. And also you can find some of the publications in our lab surrounding so our work on nephron progenitors and kind of some of the things we're going into. So, um, so yeah, the web is probably the best way to, to find us. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great to enlighten people a little more about the kidney. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.